So I always am interested as a physician to find out the cause or etiology of the pathology which is affecting this country and indeed the planet. And it's very important to psychoanalyze the people who are running this country at the moment. And you know, I can tell you a story about Cheney and I don't know much about Rumsfeld except that I am going to write a book soon called Why Men Kill and I'm going to dedicate it to Donald Rumsfeld who's going to have his picture on the frontispiece. Um, the book will be quite in-depth looking at the sociobiology of human beings, you know, when we lived in caves, the men had to kill the saber-toothed tigers and to save us as we breastfed our babies in the caves. From a neurophysiological perspective, now that, you know, we understand more about the hormonal receptors in the brain, the female and male hormone, and what that does to our behaviour, um, the Jungian archetypal perspectives of how a society can be moved, and if you watch and I want to try and psychoanalyze this one after 9-11 and just see how it just totally fell into line and was able to be manipulated and led by these people. And it's only just coming out of that anesthetic, really, to start to clearly look at the facts. So it's going to be an interesting book to write, but I'm only writing it as a physician trying to make the appropriate diagnosis because if we can't find the cause of a disease, we can't cure it. We couldn't cure poliomyelitis till we found the virus and then we could immunize the children. So, and that would go, go for cancer now. You know, many cancers we can't cure because often we don't know what causes them. Yes. So, I, when the cancer arises, it doesn't wear, wear a flag saying, I was made by some tritium you inhaled or which got through your skin at Pilgrim when you lived there, you know, 20 or 25 years ago. So, cancers do not identify their origin. So how do we know that cancer is caused by radiation? Well, we've got a wonderful guinea pig population from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were never treated. They were part of what was called the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. They were studied, not treated. No medical insurance, nothing. And so from that data, we watched the incidence of cancer and different cancers have different incubation times. We're seeing now new cancers in that population of the renal tract and of the bone marrow. So we're learning, leukemia appeared five years after the bomb dropped, so we're learning more and more about cancer. Um, so what I wanted to do was bust the myth that is put out by the nuclear energy industry to the tune of $200 million a year of propaganda. And if you read Scientific American or look at the New Yorker, you will find ads saying that nuclear power is the answer for our el el electricity needs and our children need it. Our children need it because they need their computers. Well, you know, I, th I think sort of systematically and generically, you know, Mozart wrote by candlelight. So did Shakespeare. For three million years, the human race has lived without electricity. So why suddenly is it so imperative that we have it? Well, we've gotten used to it, and now everything you get has to be plugged in. Even I bought a digital camera the other day, and to my horror, I realized it has to be plugged into the juice to be charged up. That's not like an ordinary camera where you click it and then you get the film developed. So I've become more and more conscious of how and why we use electricity. Now, nuclear power creates global warming gases. Well, why? Well, you have to create the fuel. How do you fuel a nuclear reactor? You have to dig up uranium. How do I know that? Because in Australia, we've got 40% we've got of the world's richest uranium. So you have to dig up the uranium and you use what to dig up uranium? What? Oil. <coughs> then you have to crush the uranium. Use oil to crush the uranium, you know, or petrol. You call it gasoline. Then you have to enrich the uranium, and I won't go into it, but it's all described in this book, which you're all going to get a copy of at the end, and I'll sign it for you. To enrich uranium at Paducah, Kentucky, where most of the Western world's uranium is enriched, they use two huge coal-fired plants to generate the electricity. What does that do? That releases carbon dioxide. Also, hundreds of miles of pipes containing uranium hexafluoride, which is hot, are cooled with CFC gas. CFC gas? used to be in refrigerators, damaged the ozone. Why? That's why we have huge incidence of skin cancer and melanoma in Australia, because we've got hardly any ozone layer. I've had a melanoma on my back. So it's banned under the Montreal Protocol, but the nuclear industry has been grandfathered. Therefore, it's allowed to use CFC, 
and CFC is leaking from those pipes. 93% of it released in America per year comes from the Paducah enrichment plant. And it is 10,000 to 20,000 times more potent as a global warmer than carbon dioxide. So, carbon dioxide mining, carbon dioxide milling, carbon dioxide enriching, CFC enriching. Then you get to building the huge concrete reactor. And when you make concrete, large amount of CO2 is released. Now, if you just take the front end of the fuel chain, excluding decommissioning the radioactive mausoleum by remote control and robots, because it's so hot you can't get near it, and transporting and storing the radioactive waste for the next half a million years. Exclude that part, do the front part. At the moment, a nuclear power plant releases 30% of the amount of CO2 released by a similar sized gas fire plant. As the quality in, of uranium ore declines, so within 10 or 20 years, a nuclear power plant will make the same amount of CO2 as a gas fire plant or a coal fire plant. I rest my case. And what I don't like is scientists lying. If we lie in medicine, we get stuck off the register. It's inappropriate to lie. I don't believe in freedom of speech when it comes to Rush Limbaugh, because he lies to an ignorant population. We can't afford that now. The earth is in the intensive care unit with an acute clinical emergency. Our children have no future. 10 years, 20 years, what's going to happen? Oceans rising 20 feet, 100 million refugees escaping as New York drowns and Bangladesh disappears under the waves and Anopheles mosquitoes breeding in their trillions in Seattle, causing epidemics of malaria that we've never seen before. Species dying at huge numbers. That's her future. And people say to me, you know, they say, well, it's up to the children, they've got to fix it. I find that so incredibly, intensely egocentric and selfish. I mean, how do we have children if we don't make sure they've got a safe future? So a part of being a grandparent and a parent or even a human being is to make sure our children survive. And I'm not talking about our children, I'm talking about the next seven generation hence or the next hundred generations hence.